All right, we are the Math Research Club. We meet every Friday with Dr. Spivey upstairs, and we've been working uh, last spring as well as this semester working with fractals, which we will be telling you about in this presentation. And we took this paper called On Convolving and Combining Fractals and kind of run with that, trying to figure out different properties of fractals. And before I get started, this is Lindsay, I'm Jonathan, Amanda, and Caroline, and we've been working with Dr. Spivey, as I already said, who's up there. And also, Aiden Quinlan also um, contributed to this research, which she unfortunately cannot be presenting with us today. So this paper focuses on self-similar fractals, which are a subset of all fractals as a whole. So what is a self-similar fractal? It's a structure where each part is a shrunken version of the entire whole. So if you zoom in on part of the image, you're going to get an image of what the whole entire structure looked like at the beginning. And this is produced by an iterative process. So you can continue to do this step over and over and over and shrink your image, and it will continue to look the same if you were to zoom in. So here is an example of a fractal. Uh, this is a fractal that our paper focuses on called the Sierpinski Triangle. So if you start here with a, an equilateral triangle, and you take the midpoints of each side, so bam, bam, and bam, and you connect them all together, um, and remove the triangle that's created, that is this white area here. And this is the first iteration of the Sierpinski Triangle. Um, you can then take each of these equilateral triangles, one, two, and three, that were created through that first iteration, apply this process again to get the second iteration. So that shows the iterative process. You can do this over and over and over by applying this process to each sub-triangle that is created on the iteration before. Um, so what we did to visualize these fractals is um, use the Sage Math Cloud, which is an interactive online um, IDE, so we can write Python code in this, um, on this website through this program, and we were able to create these three different fractals. So we'll be um, talking about these throughout the presentation. So we have fractal F, which you recognize from the last slide as the Sierpinski Triangle, um, fractal G right here with uh, three triangles on the outside and a upside down triangle in the middle and then fractal uh, H on the right side of your screen which is known as the Cantor triangle which is just uh, three smaller triangles in all of the corners. So why should you care about fractals? We're up here giving this math presentation. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> um, so fractals are actually present in nature as well as um, in human built uh, things that apply or supply structure. So here's um, a muscle fiber, and it is made up of these very small filaments that come together to make larger filaments, and then again larger and larger. So this is a self-similar fractal, or can be seen as one where each part is a smaller version of the entire whole. As well as here, a steel beam, or a steel uh, cable, excuse me, is made up of these small filaments that come together to make larger filaments, and then end up creating the whole entire cable to supply structure, such as in suspension bridges. Um, another application of self-similar fractals can be in uh, physiology and medicine. So there was a, a paper published in Yale's uh, Journal of Biology and Medicine where these scientists looked at self-similar fractals that exist in our body. So muscle fibers, uh, blood vessels, the bronchioles in your lungs can be seen as self-similar fractals. And they observed the states of these self-similar fractals. And they saw that if changes had been made to these fractals, to the states of them, this can hint at different diseases that could be present in the human body. <coughs> So the first thing, um, or something that this paper looked at that we also investigated was what is a convolution. So a convolution is a way of combining two fractals. So taking one fractal and taking another one and kind of smushing them together or multiplying them is, is a, a way to kind of look at this. Um, so if you take two fractals, F and G, with their associated scale factors or steps, so these sub-triangles that get created, um, little f and little g, here is the terrible mathematical definition of what a convolution is, and it's just applying uh, the first fract or the fractals to each other. So here's a visualization of that. So if you take this fractal here, make this F for this example, and G this fractal here, and you apply them, this is going to be your convoluted fractal F star G. So what happened was each of these sub triangles, one, two, three, four 
became this whole entire fractal here. So that's why there are one, two, three, and four fractals in this image that all look like this. So that is what a convolution is. So one of the things that we wanted to take a look at with convolving fractals was the commutative property of multiplication. So what is two times one? Two. And what's one times two? Two. two. So that's how numbers work, right? Is that they have this, this property. <laughs> And we find that with our fractals, the commutative property of multiplication actually does not hold. Um, so this is the calculation for it. It's nice and scary. Um, but the visual images are a lot more revealing. So what we can see, as Jonathan explained, is if we have f star g, we are taking fractal g from over here and applying it to every subtriangle of fractal f, which is, produces the image down here on the bottom. Now, similarly, if we were to do g star f, that's taking the, this fractal f and applying it to each triangle or each subtriangle in fractal g. So this one, this one, this one, and this one, which you can see makes this image down here. Um, so not commutative was the conclusion that we made from that. Now, we did like want to kind of see where these two images overlap. So. The blue image over here is G star F, and the red is F star G. And we saw that when we combine the two images on top, there is overlap in the corners or at the vertices of the triangle. Um, we don't have any definite reasoning for this, but it is something that we are looking into observing a little bit more in future research. Um, but we thought that it was pretty cool. Um, now, this image over here on the right is the same image over here, but it is the second iteration. So the second iteration of fractal G and fractal F multiplied both ways and then combined on top of each other, which was interesting to see. Um, but we found this with all of the fractals that we coded. So with G and F over here on the left, we see that the image produced down here is not the same as when we do H star G over here on the right. And similarly, the only overlap that we could find between these two convolutions were in the vertices down here in the corners. And same with F star H. Um, so the two images that are produced are very much not the same images. Um, now, we did see the same overlap in the corners for this one as well. Now, another cool property that numbers have, um, it doesn't matter where your parentheses are. So 3 times 4 is 12, times 2 is 24. Now 2 times 3 is 6 times 4, which is also 24. So numbers work that way as well. Um, but we found that even though fractal convolution is not commutative, it is associative. So if we start up at the top here and we have F, or sorry, G star H, then it's going to produce this image right down here. And then if we convolve that image with F, we are left with the image produced down here at the bottom. Now if we do the same thing and we have F star G, it will produce this purple image right here. And if we convolve that with H, we see that it produces the same image as the other side. Um, nice, long, scary calculation for that, but visually it is obvious that the images that are produced are the same. So fractals also have another quality called dimension, and basically what that is is the measure of the space filling capacity of a pattern. But the formal definition for a self-similar fractal, which are the ones that we are working with, is the unique real number d for a scale factor r greater than zero or less than one that satisfies that equation right there, which is the sum of the scale factors raised to the d equals one. So this is not a fun equation to solve for d if your scale factors are different. So if you have one fourth and one third, it's really hard to solve for d. But when you have scale factors that are all the same, you can solve this much easier equation, n times r to the d equals one, and you end up getting that d is the negative natural log of n divided by the natural log of r, which is much easier to do, you can just plug in the numbers and you're good to go. So I have some visual examples. In the first one we have a line which is one dimensional. So if you take this little piece right here and scale it by four, you end up getting the entire line. 
So it takes four of those smaller pieces to get the entire line of scale four. So that means that four pieces equals the scale raised to the one, which is your dimension. So the dimension is going to be the exponent in all of these cases. So then if you look at the square right here, you take one little square and scale it by four, you get this big square. It takes 16 of the smaller squares to get the entire big square. So 16 little pieces equals the scale four squared. So this is a two-dimensional object. And the same thing with the cube. You take one little cube, scale it by four, you get the big cube, and it takes 64 of those little cubes to get the entire cube, which is going to be your scale four cube. So that's a three-dimensional object. So in all of these, those cases, the dimension was just the exponent. So what about when you're convolving fractals? The dimension is what you would think it would be. You multiply the dimension of the first fractal, which is right here following a fancy definition from the first slide, to the, to the dimension of the second fractal, which is the second parentheses set. And that's even harder to solve. So I was talking about how it was hard to solve the dimension for one fractal if you have different scale factors. And now when you have two, it gets worse. <laughs> so what we do know is that you can get a bound on the dimension, which means that the dimension of the convolution is in between the one fractal and the other fractal, which is kind of cool. So something that we've been looking at is the comparison between the average dimension and the actual definition or dimension of a convolution. So if you look at the first row, f sub g, the dimension following the definition of dimension is 1.35 approximately. The average of f and g, so the dimension of f plus the dimension of g divided by 2, is 1.39. And so the difference is very small. And we have found that pattern in all of the fractals that we have looked at so far. Now, we haven't been able to prove this yet, but in future research it would be awesome to either find the counterexample or be able to prove that the average is a good approximation of the dimension of a convolution. Okay, so um, looking at scale factors, uh, you can create any fractal using the scale factors and that kind of goes into our calculation. So for example, with the generalized Stupinsky triangle, the scale factor or the scale factors are one half, one half, one half. So you basically take this original triangle, scale it down to half its size, and you create three copies and create a new triangle out of that and you can continue <coughs> to do that in an iterative process. Um, so one thing we found that was interesting was that the scale factors and the dimension were related. So the approximation of the dimension is very similar, as you can see, to the sum of the scale factors. And we're not sure exactly why that happens, but it, from what we've found, it only happens with um, just the um, single fractals and not with the convolutions. Um, and we're looking into how dimension and scale factors relate in the convolutions. And then, um, one of the last things, or one of the most recent things we've done is looking at another way to create a fractal. So on the screen, there are actually 10,000 plotted points. Um, so if you have this um, graph, you can choose your original point to be anywhere in the plane or anywhere on that graph. And you can choose a random vertice, um, either one of the, or any one of the three, and it has to be random. And if you continue to do that, basically you choose that first point, choose a random vertice, find the midpoint and plot the midpoint, and then using that midpoint you find another vertice and you plot the mid midpoint between that and the vertice, and if you do that um, infinite amount of times, you'll create a fractal. And so that's what that is, except for only 10,000 points. So we just wanted to say thank you so much to Dr. Spivey for all of his help throughout the past couple semesters, and for Dr. McQuiston for inviting us to be a part of this today. Um, and thank you guys for coming out and being here. properties and saw that it did it, it was like magic to me. Um, and so I'm wondering if that was something that you were thinking of, now I'm thinking like a scientist, did you feel like you were proving your hypothesis or disproving your hypothesis with the, the other one that didn't work out? Or was it magic to you that it worked? Or how, how, how was it, what was it like to do this research and have these conclusions? I guess is the easier way to ask it. Um, I can say, at least for me, from seeing that it wasn't commutative, my first assumption was that no, of course it's not going to be associative, because just intuitively that doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Um, but after going through and visualizing the images, it kind of, like when you see it all plugged together, it is just like you said, it's kind of like a magical moment where you realize like, oh wow, that is pretty cool that it just somehow produces the same image. Um, but like you said, my, our original hypothesis was maybe, probably not, and then it did end up, you know, working. And we started actually running those calculations, you can kind of see it almost start to fall out to you that, oh, this is going to work. Okay. So it, it was something we wanted to try and actually being able to visualize the fractals with the computer helped us to be able to kind of look to see if these things were going to be possible. So in the math, if we think of the math as your raw data, you were seeing that it looked like it was going to happen and then the visualization kind of confirmed what you were seeing in the math. I would almost see our, our, our calculations as more as like the actual experiment. Okay. And while we were conducting the experiment, we're collecting data in real time, I guess, and that kind of allowed us to see that, oh, it looks like it's going to work. That's awesome. We have a lot in common, even though I can't understand your work. And you <laughs> Other questions? Dr. Wright. Is there some sense of why, uh, are there functions that would commute if you can vault them? Or, or I'm sorry, are there, uh, are there, uh, are there any that, like SMGs that would commute, or is there some sense of when that should or should not happen? I mean, we only looked at three, okay. just FGH. We didn't find any, but it's possible. Is there something that's obvious in the math where it's like this factor doesn't go away and that's why it doesn't commute? Or is it? <coughs> yeah, I don't awesome. believe so. Uh, I couldn't read the math quite that good, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's. It's a matter of the scale factors would have to be the same for the the little f, little g, and little h. Is they would have to be the same scale factor and be mapped the same yeah, in the kind same of way. Of, so the very specific says why that it would, in order for it to be something really miraculous to happen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because visually you can kind of see, um, and especially with the associativity thing, um, when you cut, get to this point that this, this convolution is still applying this triangle to each one of these three, and you can kind of see, so down here we have that triangle, and then there's the other one, and then the other one, and then the same thing happens here where we're applying this one to all three of these, which is a little bit harder to see, I think, but it's like, there's that little one, and again and again. So the only reason that this works is because those two, you know, was math. <laughs> and, That's often true, yes. Yeah, and so I don't see where, unless the original, unless like this was F and this was G or something like that, if that would work. So how does the associated property inform the real life examples you gave earlier in the applications? I mean, I'm thinking about applications of fractals. If I mean, thinking of sort of a medical area, you could create a 3D model of those muscle fibers using fractals. I mean, if that's a self-similar fractal, that can be, you could figure out a way to create that using 3D printing, which I think, I don't know exact, I don't know anything about medicine or like that <laughs> realm, but I feel like you could be able to, you could use that in some way, in some really applicable way. And if, if like that paper that was published said that if you observe these fractal states that can kind of tell you about the body, I think it's worth knowing properties about the fractals and properties about what might be going on in the body. So. We, we don't know what's gonna, what, what we're going to learn from it. And, and with associativity, you can use, like we have here, three different fractals to create a new fractal. So that's in that sort of application, you can create the fractals that you need using associativity and finding different fractals and combining them in different ways to create other fractals. All right, thank you.